Now I want to talk about the anatomy of Neanderthals and how it came to be that we recognize them as being something different from us and today the way that we study those differences to understand the way that they were adapting to their past climatic circumstances. The first skull of Neanderthals when it was found it was immediately recognized that this skull had some differences from a modern human's skull. And so if I just look at a cranial example of a modern human, this skull has, like almost every modern human in the world, a very rounded cranial profile. It's a skull that is relatively short from front to back and tall from bottom to top. It's rounded in the front. It's also rounded in the back. And if we look at this skull from the rear, we'll notice that the broadest point on this skull is fairly high up on the skull. It's not here at the base as it would be in Homo erectus, and it's not here in the middle, it's sort of high. Those cranial characteristics we see in most populations in the world today. If we look at the cranial vault of a Neanderthal skull, you will notice that it has a brow ridge that protrudes in front of its brain case. It has a groove above that brow ridge. We call that the sulcus. And above that, it has a little bit of a bulge at the front of a very long skull. This is the original Neanderthal skull from the Neander Valley. You'll notice that the width of the skull is widest about halfway up. It's not wide at the bottom, it's not wide up above. It's wide about midway. It's what we call sometimes barrel shaped. And finally, the back of this Neanderthal skull, the posterior most part, has a bulge that protrudes outwards. It's not a bar of bone like it is in some examples of Homo erectus. It's a bulge at the back of the skull. We don't know what the importance of that bulge is. It, is reflected on the interior of the skull, so it may have affected the shape of the posterior part of the brain, but that bulge is very distinctive in Neanderthals. We call it the occipital bun. Those kinds of characteristics, when people studied these Neanderthal skulls, they, they saw this is something that's fairly different from the skulls of recent people. Those differences also occur up and down the skeleton. I want to show you a femur of a Neanderthal. This is the thigh bone. And the thigh bone has a ball at the top of it that's part of the ball and socket joint of your hip. It has a fairly flattened surface at the bottom, which is what sits on top of the tibia. And it transmits force across its shaft from the proximal to the distal end of it. The Neanderthal femur has a distinct curvature to it. This is a very curved bone. It's a bone that's very stout. It has a large ball or head to that ball and socket joint. It has a very large distal articular surface. This is a bone that looks like it's built to transmit a lot of force through it. And that force is being transmitted across the proximal and distal ends of that bone. Now I've selected to compare to that bone a human bone from our collection this bone is one of the largest, stoutest human femurs that we've got here in the lab. This is a person that's about my body size, maybe a little larger. And when we look at the ball of that ball and socket joint, you can see it's a large one. It's probably bigger than mine. It is nowhere near the size of that ball in this Neanderthal. Likewise, if we look at the distal end, the distal ends of these bones are very different in size. And I've got to say, I have selected this out of our collection. It's a large collection of femur, and I've selected it to be as bowed in its shape as any one that I can find in our collection. And nevertheless, you can see that the curvature in that Neanderthal femur is extreme relative to the curvature, which is very slight in this human bone. Those are characteristics by which Neanderthal postcrania vary really consistently between their anatomy and human anatomy. They're characteristics that reflect the muscularity of these ancient people, the fact that they're built for a high level of activity, and that activity is in locomotion, it's in getting around. They're tough people. I talk about Neanderthals as if they're muscular and tough because they clearly were, and yet, they were hunter-gatherers. We're not talking about colossal-sized humans who are hugely muscled and look like they've been weightlifting. 
These are bandy-legged, very tough, very strong, and relatively small people. The tallest Neanderthals we have are about human height, but the average height for male Neanderthals is substantially shorter than the average height for males in most human populations today. It's around five foot five, five foot six, or around 165, 170 centimeters. It's a, it's a relatively short height compared to the averages today. So they're tough people, they're a little bit smaller than today, and if we look at the proportions of the bones in their limbs, this is the tibia, the lower limb bone, and this is the femur, the upper limb bone. When we look at the proportions between these, we will notice that the tibia is a little bit shorter relative to this femur length than it is in most human populations today. The humans today that share the same proportions as these Neanderthals are humans that live at fairly high latitudes, humans that live in cold places. This shortening of the distal parts of the limbs and a relatively smaller body size coupled with a relatively larger body mass, those are changes that adapted the Neanderthals to their relatively cold climate. When I say relatively cold, we know that they lived in Europe during the last glaciation. I mean, it was a colder place. But Neanderthals lived in that relatively cold place with a minimum of cultural intervention, helping to protect them from their cold climate. So they couple this living in a fairly cold place. They weren't living on the glaciers or on the tundra. They were living in southern Europe. It was a cold place relative to now, but what made it especially severe for them was the minimal amount of cultural adaptations that they had to ameliorate the effects of that cold environment, to give themselves additional avenues to keep warm. And so they adapted to cold with their anatomy, whereas today we would tend to adapt to cold more with our culture. Neanderthals were not uniform across their entire geographic range. And they existed across the time period from 150,000 years ago up until as recently as 30,000 years ago. That's a substantial depth of time. They also existed across a substantial geographic space from Spain in the west all the way to the Altai Mountains in the east. This is a huge geographic area. We have some Neanderthal specimens that cover most of that area. When we look at Neanderthals, we see differences across time. We also see differences over space. So when we look, for example, at the earliest Neanderthals, this is a skull from Krapina. It's about 120,000 years old. It's from Croatia. And this skull is not the earliest Neanderthal, but it does represent a relatively early Neanderthal sample. When we look at this skull, it's a female skull, we think. It's got a brow ridge. It's got the characteristic Neanderthal shape to this front of the cranium. What it doesn't have are some of the features that become very important later in time in Neanderthals. It doesn't have a nose that projects forward from its face a great deal. So this skull from Krapina, from the earliest Neanderthals, doesn't have many of the features that become really important later in time. When we look at this skull, which is a reconstruction of a classic Neanderthal, this one from La Chapelle aux Saints in France, a skull that's about 50,000 to 60,000 years old, you can see some of those features that become important in the classic Neanderthals. Again, the skull is relatively low and long. It has this bulge at the back, the occipital bun, and it has a brow ridge over its orbits. But when we look at its face, you can see that its nose sticks way out in front of its brow ridge. Its face looks like it's been pulled forward. And that classic Neanderthal look is one that an anthropologist in the middle of the 20th century, Carlton Kuhn, said looks like you were pulling forward on a rubber face so that you had a face that was sticking way forward out. This characteristic morphology is really common among the classic Neanderthals of Europe at the height of Neanderthals around 50,000 years ago. But when we look at the last Neanderthals, we don't see that morphology again. This skull 
from Saint-Césaire in France. It's about 36,000 years old, and it doesn't have a face that projects way out in front of its brow ridge. It, in fact, has a relatively slim and narrow brow ridge. It's a face that doesn't have the same intensity of Neanderthal characteristics as those that are in the Western European Neanderthals earlier in time. Those Neanderthals vary over time, in other words. They also vary across space. This skull is from Amud. It's a cave in the Levant, in present-day Israel, and this cave has this skull from something like 45,000, 50,000 years ago. The Amud skull, its face has been mostly reconstructed, but you can see it does have a fairly prominent nose. What it doesn't have is an occipital bun. It also differs from other Neanderthals in its body size. It's a relatively tall person, as we assess from its postcranial skeleton, and its jaw differs to a certain extent from other Neanderthals. The Amud jaw is a jaw that has a characteristic Neanderthal feature, this space behind the third molar, the retromolar space, but has another feature that's most characteristic of modern people, a chin. And so when we look at Neanderthals across space, we also begin to notice that they have heterogeneity, this variability over space. We know today that Neanderthals share some genes with living people. And so the big idea about the Neanderthal skeletal remains is how do they give us evidence about what this mixture may have been like? Neanderthal skeletal remains vary from place to place. They also vary over time. The mixture that occurred with African peoples that were emerging from Africa and spreading throughout the world is a mixture that probably occurred in some Neanderthal populations much more so than others. The Neanderthals on the scene as people left Africa are Neanderthals of West Asia, Neanderthals like this Amud Neanderthal from the Levant. When we think about mixture with a population like that, it's not quite the same as mixing with the classic Neanderthals. And when we look at mixture in Europe, as people are entering Europe and thinking about the ways that Neanderthals that were in Europe may have been influenced by movement from outside of Europe, the later Neanderthal biology begins to make some sense. Why is it that the classic Neanderthals are the most extremely divergent in their morphology and later Neanderthals are less extremely divergent from humans? It could very well be that those later Neanderthals are subject to some mixing from modern human populations and some adaptation to the changing climate and cultural circumstances. To answer that question, we really have to look in more detail at the genetics and also look in detail at how the climate is influencing them and how their cultures are beginning to adapt them as opposed to their anatomy. So Neanderthals represent one of the last stages in our evolution in which our anatomy is our primary mode of adapting to our ecology, and our culture has not yet quite taken charge. As we move into looking at modern humans, we will see the greater influence of culture and the co-evolution of human culture with anatomical change. And that's going to lay the groundwork for looking at modern humans.